Hello, everybody. Thank you all for coming out tonight to our Fiction and Forms event. I have the honor of introducing Alexander Chi. Um, you guys are all in for a treat. I first met Alex Chi in Iowa City almost 10 years ago. We bonded over the fact that we both drove the same shitty car, a black 1996 Geo Prism, about the most uncool car a guy could own. I liked him immediately. At that point, I'd not re yet read his debut novel, The Lyrical, Electric, and Devastating Edinburgh, but I'd heard a lot about him. Every writer I, I knew seemed to know Alex, and everyone had something to say about him, about his honesty, his generosity, his humor, and his wide range of interests and pursuits, both high and low, from opera to punk rock, literature to comic books, academia to street activism. When I finally did read Edinburgh, soon after meeting Alex, the novel about a teenage boy who was molested by his choir teacher and who cannot find a voice to describe what has happened to him seemed to leave me, too, voiceless in response. Regardless, I assigned the book in a class I was teaching on first novels, and my students similarly found it hard to define its inner workings. They could mostly just marvel at its remarkable beauty. Some art does this. It resists analysis, refusing to lay open its mechanics, and simply insists on being something singular and undefinable. In his new collection of essays, How to Write an Autobiographical Novel, Alex remembers a test he was given as a young boy to determine if he might be psychic. He writes, quote, the test was a guided meditation in which we were asked to close our eyes and imagine sinking through water deeper and deeper and then rising out of the water into the sunlight, end quote. I realized as I read this that this was my experience re reading Edinburgh, an experience of being underwater, time slowed, blue and beautiful at times, at other times murky and frightening, but something in the language always promising sunlight above. His next novel, The Queen of the Night, took him something like 15 years to write and was a wholly different kind of book, a vast, sweeping historical novel set in the 19th century world of Parisian opera. In some ways, it's surprising that this is a book from the same hand as produced Edinburgh, but it has Alex's DNA running all through it. With his range as a writer already proven, how to write an autobiographical novel introduced me to yet another Alexander Chi, nonfiction that is sharp and clear and unambiguous, and I found myself immersed in a book I wish I'd had when I was a young writer. In it, there is a lot about books and the act of writing, but there is also much about what it is to be a writer. And for me, the book highlighted the fact that while writing may be a solitary act, being a writer isn't. Being a writer today means to be connected to the world, engaged with eyes wide open. It's a way of being I'm still learning. And over the years, I've learned, a, I've learned a lot from it, a lot of it from watching and reading Alexander Chi. Please extend him a warm welcome. Thank you, Gus, for that introduction. Thank you all for coming out today. Thank you to the program for inviting me. Uh, this is a, the view here is really stunning. <laughs> If I get distracted while I'm talking to you, I'm just sort of staring at it. I guess this book is, it seemed like the natural next thing to do in one way. I had written, I saw when I did my tenure case, I'd written 70 essays in 20 years, some. And, and so then, and that was two years ago. <laughs> um, so there's more now. Um, I, I was, I've been joking that I could have another one out just like that, um, just to crush the spirit of my rivals. Um, uh, just keep, pump, keep bumping books out for a while after taking a de over a decade. But we'll see if I do. This collection began, though, specifically when I was asked to speak at a nonfiction, at Columbia's nonfiction program and I realized I didn't have a book and everyone else in the lineup did. And I started thinking about why that was. I'd asked my agent about an essay collection in about 2007. Um, and she said, 
finish your novel and don't talk to me about this. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so when I, I was done with the novel and, and then she was happy to talk to me about it. And so I started thinking of like, how do you put a collection together? Which I think is something that is really interesting to think about. Stories are one exercise and I think essays are quite a different one. With stories, there's a lot of pressure sometimes from publishers to create inter at least interconnected short stories. But I was very aware with essay collections, like my own favorite essay collections, I would, I would read maybe one essay sometimes and leave them alone for years and then go back and maybe read another, so on. But some of them I would also just read all at once, one, by, one after the other. And, and so I knew I had to make a book that would, that would hold up to both kinds of reading, essentially. The resulting book, I would say, has a loose, uh, and has a loose chronological order. And so I've taken to calling it interconnected stories of the self, in a sense. But um, it is by no means a memoir, and the, the essays do range widely in topic. So I'm going to read today from, from one called The Autobiography of My Novel, which is my attempt to write about the writing of my first novel, Edinburgh. And it's also something of a tribute to the MFA students, I guess because it's about that specific post-MFA crisis where you finish your degree, you're alone in the world with your degree, and you think, oh God, I'm dead. <laughs> um, <laughs> so... Here we go. The question came amid some more ordinary ones. How long did the book take to write? And did you do any research? Seven years, and yes. And then were you a victim of sexual abuse yourself? Yes. Why didn't you just write about your experience? The reader asked me. Why isn't it a memoir? I looked at him and felt confused for a moment. I didn't understand the question immediately. The questioner sounded annoyed as if I were deliberately hiding something from him, as if he had ordered steak and gotten salmon. Had I chosen, I felt in the presence of conflicting, confusing truths. I was talking with a book club in downtown Manhattan on Wall Street, a paper cup of coffee on the table in front of me. All of us were seated around a conference table, blinking under a fluorescent light that felt along the skin and eyes, both thin and heavy at once, like this question. The questioner was an otherwise nice white man, a few years older than me, I guessed. He would have been in high school when it all happened to me, and I wouldn't have told him about it then. That I could even speak to him about it now was not lost on me. The things I saw in my life, the things I learned, didn't fit back into the boxes of my life, I said. My experiences, if described, wouldn't portray the vision they gave me. I saw the room's other occupants take this in. I had to make something that fit to the shape of what I saw, I said. That seemed to satisfy them. I waited for the next question. That afternoon I tried to understand if I had made a choice about what to write, but instead it seemed to me if anyone had made a choice, the novel had, choosing me like I was a door and walking through me out into the world. I began in the summer of 1994, I had just finished my MFA and moved into an apartment with my younger brother and sister off of Columbus Avenue on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. My brother was starting his first job in finance at a stock brokerage. My, mother, my sister was beginning her studies at Columbia University. I used to joke that we were a little like the Glass family from Salinger's novels and stories, except our mother was in Maine, alone with her own troubles. But the truth was more complicated and more melodramatic than the world of a Salinger novel. My mother had been betrayed by a business partner who vanished, leaving behind altered partnership agreements, indemnifying her for his debts. When she declared bankruptcy, she also sold our family home. She had mostly hidden her problems from us until they could no longer be hidden. And to this day, I think we three siblings moved in together in New York at the same time she was forced out of our family home because it was the single self-protective gesture we could make that was entirely under our control. The means by which I had made my way in the world prior to that summer were coming to an end. Grad school was over, as was my accompanying stipend, my inheritance, a fund left to me, 
after my father's death and meant for my education, was likewise almost spent. The move back to New York would exhaust it. I had not won any grants or gotten any of the postgrad programs I had applied for. The despair I felt as each possible future I had dreamed of dropped away with yet another rejection was the surface of me. Underneath that, on the inside, I could feel my family fracturing myself too. I kept seeing reports that summer of other writers, some of them friends of mine, selling their novels, some of them unfinished for what seemed like outlandish sums of money. I thought it was my turn when a friend from college who worked in the fiction department at the New Yorker asked me for stories, and I sent her part of my then novel in progress, which was to be a book about AIDS activists in the late 1980s in New York and San Francisco. While she found the excerpts weren't right for the magazine, she admired what I submitted enough to send the pages to an editor she knew at William Morrow. The editor, in turn, liked the pages enough to tell me he wanted to have his house consider the unfinished novel for publication. This interest quickened the interest of a friend's literary agent, who became my first literary agent, and I spent a happy 10 days hoping this was it. But the house eventually passed on the novel, thinking it would be too large to publish based on my synopsis. They fear it will be 600 pages long, my new agent said. Her advice, if you finish it, then no one will be guessing how long it will be, because we'll know, and we'll just send it out then. I tried to master my desperation at this news. What happened next was a product of my cynicism, my youth, and my anger. By now, it was clear our apartment was too expensive for us, at least based on the money my siblings and I were actually earning. And my sister, due to my mother's bankruptcy, it seemed like she would have to leave Columbia. I could have finished that first novel already in progress. In just a year's time, as if to mock me, several novels more than 600 pages long would appear, and the year after that, Infinite Jest, weighing in at 1,079 pages. Length was not the issue, though. I could have tried even one other publisher, but I didn't. Instead, I became obsessed with the idea that I could sell an unfinished novel and that the money might be enough to save my family. I began what would become my first published, finished novel, with the idea that autobiographical fiction was as easy as writing down what was happening to me. I turned my back on the experimental novel I'd put forward and told anyone I knew, I'm just going to write a shitty autobiographical novel like everyone else and sell it for thousands and thousands of dollars. And then I sat down to try. The story of your life described will not describe how you came to think about your life or yourself, nor describe any of what you learned. This is what fiction can do. I think it is even what fiction is for but learning this was still ahead of me. I knew what I thought was normal for a first novel, but every first novel is the answer to the question of what is normal for a first novel. Mine came to me in pieces at first, as if it were once whole and someone had broken it and scattered it inside me, hiding until it was safe for it to be put back together. In the time before I understood that I was writing this novel, each time a piece of it appeared, I felt as if I'd received a strange valentine from a part of me that had a very different relationship to language than the me that walked around, had coffee with friends, and hoped for the best out of every day. The words, the words felt both old and new, and the things they described were more real to me when I reread them than the things my previous sentences had tried to collect inside them. And so while I wrote this novel, I didn't feel that I could say that I chose to write this novel. The writing felt both like an autonomic process, as compulsory as breathing, or the beat of the heart, at the same time as if an invisible creature had moved into a corner of my mind and had begun building itself, making visible parts out of things dismantled from my memory, summoned from my imagination. I was spelling out a message that would allow me to talk to myself and to others. The novel that emerged was about things I could not speak of in life, in some cases, literally. I would lie, or I would feel a weight on my chest as if someone was sitting there. But when the novel was done, I could read from it, a prosthetic voice. Prior to this, my sentences were often criticized in writing workshops for being only beautiful and lacking meaning. I felt I understood what they meant and worked to correct it, but didn't really think about what this meant until the novel was done. I'd once organized my life, my conversation, even my sentences in such a way as to never say what I was now trying to write. I had avoided the story for years with all the force I could bring to bear, intellectual, emotional, physical. Imagine a child's teeth after wearing a gag for 13 years. That is what my sentences were like then, 
pushing around the shape of a story I did not want to tell, but pointing all the same to what was there. I have a theory of the first novel now, that it is something that makes the writer, even as the writer makes the novel, that it must be something you care about enough to see through to the end. I tell my students all the time, writing fiction is an exercise in giving a shit, an exercise in finding out what you really care about. Many student writers become obsessed with aesthetics, but I find that it's usually a way to avoid whatever it is they have to say. My first novel was not the first one I started. It was the first one I finished. Looking at my records, I count three previously unfinished novels. Pieces of one of them went into this first one, but the one I finished, I finished because I asked myself a question. What will you let yourself know? What will you allow yourself to know? The idea of autobiographical fiction had always rankled me. Whenever I told stories about my family to friends, they always told me to write about my family. And I hated the suggestion so much that I didn't write about families at all. Even so, most of what I wrote then, if not all of it, was in some way autobiographical. My central characters were typically a cipher to me, like me but not me, with one-syllable names, Jack Cho, for example, the recurring character, and four of my first published stories, all a part of that rejected experimental novel. Jack was a Korean-American gay man from San Francisco, the only son of a single mother, who moves to New York for love and becomes involved in ACT UP. His relationship to me was more than accidental, but not so close that I couldn't delineate his experiences from my own. The name, Cho, was like Chi, a name that was Chinese and also Korean. I invented Jack to help me think through my relationship to activism and sex. Other stories I wrote at the time were investigations of various friendships, relationships, and breakups. I was, meanwhile, struggling with a different existential issue from the ones my writing peers from more normative backgrounds simply didn't have to address. Kit Reed, my undergraduate fiction teacher, first identified it. She told me that if I was fast enough, I might be the first Korean-American novelist. She wasn't entirely right. Young Hill Kang was, in fact, that person, but he was until recently lost to contemporary literary history. And when Chang Rae Lee published New Native Speaker in 1995, she said, well, you'll be the first gay one. And she would be right. None of this was inherently interesting to me, however, at age 20 and felt strange and even uncomfortable to aspire to. I was by now used to people being surprised by me and my background and their surprise offended me. I was always having to be what I was looking for in the world, wishing that the person I would become already existed some other eye before me. I was forever finding even the tiniest way to identify with someone to escape how empty the world seemed to be of what I was. My long-standing love for the singer Roland Gift, for example, came partly from finding out that he was part Chinese, the same for the model Naomi Campbell. Unspoken in all of this was that I didn't feel Korean American in a way that felt reliable. I was still discovering that this identity, any identity really, was unreliable precisely because it was self-made. When people told me to write about my family, it felt like I was being told that my imagination wasn't good enough, but also that I could only write one kind of person, a double standard in which as a fiction writer I was supposed to invent characters from whole cloth and yet also tattoo my biography onto each one of them. I think every writer with a non-canonical background or even a canonical one faces this at some point. I was fighting with this idea in any case when I pulled out a binder I had promised myself I would look at once I got to New York. I had created the binder a few months earlier in the spring as I was going through my papers, deciding what to save and what to throw away when I left Iowa. I discovered some pieces of writing that initially seemed to have no common denominator. There was a short story written in college, several unpublished poems whose blank verse felt a little too blank, more lyrical prose than prose poem, a fragment of an unfinished novel with a scene in which a young man kills himself by setting himself on fire and a fragment of an unfinished autobiographical essay about the lighthouses in my hometown at night. I put them all in a binder and said out loud, when we get to New York, tell me what you are. I think I knew all along the process of writing a novel was less straightforward than it seemed, but thus far it hadn't seemed straightforward at all. Perhaps out of a desire not to appear prescriptive, at no point in my education as a writer had my teachers offered specific instructions on the writing of novels and stories. 
We read novels and stories copiously, argued about what they were constantly, but plot was disdained as if it was ever discussed. And in general, I went through the MFA feeling as though I had to learn everything by context clues, as if I had wandered into a place where everyone already knew what I did not know, and I had to catch up without letting on. The one conversation I can remember having about the conception of a novel had come indirectly several years earlier in college when I was at work on my first collection of short stories for creative writing thesis. I had the good fortune to be classmates with the writer, Dina Hoffman, who read my collection and delivered this news. I think that these all want to be a novel, she said. I think you want to write a novel. Hoffman's idea that day challenged me at first. I'd been trying very hard to write stories, and I felt as if I had failed. The connection between the stories seemed at best remote to me, but over time I understood she saw the way each of them had roots that connected to one another, and also the way I'd formed a narrative in my ordering of them. Even the enjambments between sections gave the reader the pause you feel as you understand a story is about to unfold. And so when it didn't go further, it felt like a mistake. This vision of my own process and the way it has informed what I do and even how I teach continues to this day. That day, when I asked my fragments to tell me what they were and we arrived in New York before I got into my loaded car and drove there, I knew I was calling out to a novel. I knew these pieces had their own desire to be whole. And as I opened the binder that summer in New York and read through the fragments again, I could sense the shadow of something in the links possible between them and began to write to the shape of it. The first plot I came up with was drawn right from that summer. The drama of my mother's bankruptcy seemed at the time a good place to start. A young man returns home to help his mother move out of their family home. She's been forced into bankruptcy after being betrayed by a business partner. And the son finds her lost in depression and grief, still grieving her husband, his father, who had died eight years earlier. The son plots his revenge on the lawyer he sees as responsible for his mother's current troubles, hoping at least to find a measure of justice. And then a lightning strike burns the lawyer's house to the ground. That actually happened. It's very satisfying. <laughs> um, the main character was, of course, another cipher for me. At 135 pages, I sent it to my agent, who said it's beautifully written, but it's a little hokey, in the sense that no one is going to believe this many bad things happen to one person. I laughed. I'd often found my own life implausible. Still, it really picks up after page 90, she said. Keep going. When I look at that first manuscript, I can see again how the plot was, well, not a plot, it was only a list of things that had happened. I also saw what she saw change on page 90. After the narrator visits his father's grave, the novel moves into the past and into the present tense. And this is a quote from the original manuscript. This is how I remember the summer of being 12 to 13. Foghorn nights, days on bicycles at beaches, lunches of sandwiches and soda. My mother works to get recycling made mandatory, sends me off into parking lots with hands full of bottle bill bumper stickers as she does the grocery shopping. My hair is long and wavy and I am vain about the blonde highlights that my temples that my father admires. Summer in Maine starts with the black flies and mosquitoes rising out of the marshes to fill the woods and they drive the deer mad enough to run in the roads. The tan French Canadians arrive in cars, wear bikinis, eat lobsters, glitter in their gold jewelry and suntan oils. New Yorkers bewilder and are bewildered, a little cranky, the Massachusetts contingent, lords around, arrogant, bemused. They are all we have, these visitors. The fisheries industry is dying, the shoe manufacturing industry, the potato farms, all are dying. Our fish are gone, our shoes are too expensive to make, the potatoes not big enough. The shallow water lobster was made extinct the year I was born quietly dropped into a pot, and now we serve the deep water brothers and sisters. The bay no longer freezes in winter and dolphins have not visited us in decades. In a few years, cutbacks will close our naval yards. Soon a donut shop will be a nervous place to be. We can only serve the visitors and make sure everything is peaceful and attractive as we sell them our homes, the furnishings inside them, the food we couldn't think of eating. A space break. And then, the sun is hours from setting. I am sunburned, tired, covered in sand. I go into the bathroom, lock the door, and lay down on the floor. 
On my back, the cool tiles count themselves. I pull down my trunks, kick them across the floor to the door. The only light, a faint stream coming in through the crack, a silver green. I look into it and wait for time to pass. I'd moved into the present tense as I had the idea of making the novel into something like Cat's Eye by Margaret Atwood, a novel I loved and told in alternating points of view from the same person at different times in her life. An artist goes home for a retrospective of her work and memories of the scalding love of her best friend from childhood return and overwhelm her. The novel uses past tense for the sections in the present and present tense for the sections in the past. And between the two, the reader senses what the girl experienced from that the adult does not remember. I was interested in this idea of the self brought to a confrontation with the past through the structures of the narration. I found that writing in the present tense acted as self-hypnosis. Discussions of the use of the tense speak often of the effect on the reader, but the effect on the writer is just as important. Using it casts a powerful spell on the writer's own mind, and it is a commonly used spell. The present is the verb tense of the casual story told in person to a friend. So I'm at the park, and I see this woman I almost recognize a gesture many of us use. It is also the tense victims of trauma use to describe their own assaults. The pages previous to this in the present tense shed a little light on what my agent meant by, no one will believe this many bad things happen to one person. The draft included my father's car accident and subsequent coma and the suicidal rage he emerged with and which returned in storms until his eventual death. My father's family's various betrayals of us, ranging from stealing bank statements for my father's business to suing for custody of me and my siblings to accusing my mother of infidelity while she was caring for my own father. And my own suicidal feelings and sexual abuse, which I hadn't told anyone about because I feared becoming even more of a pariah than I already was just for being mixed race. And while it had never felt like love or community, it had almost felt like not being alone. These autobiographical events were not organized in any way. When I was helping my mother move, I noticed she had not moved in. She had just left everything where the movers had dropped it. I had the sense of being in the presence of a metaphor, and I was. My novel draft was like that. Page 90 was where my narrator's attention turned inward when he looked away from the crisis in his mother's life to see his own. I cut those first 90 pages and continued with the remaining 45, using them as the new beginning. These pages took up the problem of my narrator's silence and his urge to self-destruct, and I saw it as if for the first time. The college story in the Fragments Binder had been my first attempt to write about my own abuse, a story about a boy in a boys' choir who cannot speak about what is happening to him and thus can't warn away the other boys, and so the director continues his crimes until he is arrested and the boy blames himself for the role his silence played in the ongoing disaster. The boy wants to kill himself once the crimes are revealed, ashamed of his silence more than anything else, and is prevented by the accidental intervention of a friend, a victim also, one of the boys he was unable to protect. This, I understood, was where that story belonged. I had written my way there. As I continued on, this would happen again and again. I would pause, find a place to insert a section from the binder, and continue. In an interview Deborah Eisenberg gave to the Iowa Review, she describes learning from Ruth Prower Jabvala that it is possible to write a kind of fake autobiography. And that idea, as I understood it, guided me next. I needed to make a fake autobiography for someone like me but not me, giving him the situations of my life but not the events. He would be a little more unhinged, a little less afraid, a little more angry. These interventions were also ethical and gave everyone else involved in the real events some necessary distance. To begin imagining the memories that drew my narrative into his past, I found I kept thinking of what that boy was looking into in the light under the crack in the door. There's a quote in my journals from June 4th, 1998, four years into the writing of the novel. These stories are gothics and have in common a myth of a kind where the end result is the same paralysis. I don't remember who said this to me. There is no attribution and no context. I think I must have thought I would always remember the speaker my hubris as such, a common omission in my journals. My journals which are full of people telling me things that I, I just, I don't remember who they are. So anyway, um, but it succinctly describes so many of my early attempts at fiction, even what I thought of as my life 
and what I was reading and the primary challenge I faced next with the novel. The boy needed a plot. I wanted to write a novel that would take a reader by the collar and run. And yet I was drawn to writing stories in which nothing happened. My stories and early novel starts were often criticized for their lack of plot. I was imitating the plotless fiction of the 1980s, but also, it seems, lost in a landscape where I was unthinkingly reenacting the traumas of my youth. All of my stories lacked action or ended in inaction because that was what my imagination had always done to protect me from my own life. The child's mistaken belief that if he stays still and silent, he cannot be seen. And this was wrong. Yet I believed it without quite knowing it. In light of this insight, I knew I needed a new imagination, and I needed to imagine action. I'll stop there. <laughs>